After the protests at McMaster University, Jordan Peterson received a copy of a letter written by Pakbeck to other officials at McMaster University. Pakbeck is the President's Advisory Committee on Building an Inclusive Community. Subsequently, Jordan Peterson has also posted a video on YouTube entitled Go Ahead, Make My Day. He is encouraging and offering to debate anyone on the issues of science and biological sex. Although his video touches upon all of the letter, he reads it in its entirety. I just wanted to touch upon two sections. The first of which reads, Instead, the concept of freedom of speech has most often been mobilized to protect specific counter-hegemonic ideas, ideas that actually challenge rather than reiterate the status quo. Freedom of speech was also not conceived as a means to protect normative ideas from contestation by marginalized communities, but to protect those whose speech might actually contest normative or nationalist ideals from censure, punishment, or retaliation by state forces. Now, to me, that it clearly misses the point. Free speech is supposed to apply to everybody, regardless of what your opinion is. The government can place limitations on speech that may be excessively detrimental or harmful, but it should do so with the utmost caution, and only for the most heinous or outrageous of offenses or violations. The letter here is basically saying that the group that is being oppressed gets to use freedom of speech, not the group that is just trying to keep things the way they are. And the question there becomes, well, who's being oppressed? Or who's got the counter ideas? And whose ideas should be protected by allowing argument and open discussion. How wrong they are in this letter is clear, I think, just by this one point. Freedom of speech has to apply to everybody on either side of that argument. Again, unless it is so detrimental and so heinous and it is doing something that it incites violence, freedom of speech has to apply to everybody. The second part here that I wanted to touch upon in a little bit more detail says there is nothing rebellious or revolutionary about insisting on the naturalness of the now long debunked gender binary or of what Dr. Peterson describes as the biological fact, in quotes, of sexual difference neatly categorizable as, in quotes, male and, in quotes, female, a fact again in quotes, subjected to intense critique, questioning, and reconsideration by numerous scholars in the humanities, social sciences, and even the biological sciences for several decades now, which demonstrates the limited extent of Dr. Peterson's knowledge on this subject, since he seems either entirely unaware of this body of literature, or else unwilling to engage with the challenge it poses for his own arguments. Now, the biological fact is in quotes, along with the words male and female. And then fact, again, is placed in quotes. And then, you know, that followed with that fact has been under intense critique and scrutiny. Now, Nicholas Matt, who teaches Intro to Trans Studies at the University of Toronto, when in conversation with Jordan Peterson, said, It is not correct that there is such a thing as biological sex. This is a very popular misconception. I don't focus on pronouns because pronouns are actually part of a cis-normative culture. We don't start from a cis-normative perspective because that can't actually go very far. Cis-normative is basically the very popular idea and assumption that most people probably have and definitely that our structures convey that there is such a thing as male and female, that they connect to being a boy or a girl or a man or a woman. Now, Nicholas Matt also compared Jordan Peterson to committing assaults and to committing hate speech. Now, there is a journal, The Biology of Sex Differences, that is completely dedicated to studying the differences between the sexes to be able to apply that knowledge to various other fields, such as medicine. The discussion here as to whether or not male and female exists, or whether or not there is a biological sex difference between men and women, is not closed. It is ongoing, and that should be clear. What's so often lost in all of this debate is that Jordan Peterson began with a disagreement in the use of legislation. The principle of the government making law that compels speech is what he disagrees with. For him, the matter transcends the transgender issue entirely. We've got a list of pronouns, and pronouns can be used in the first person, the second person, and the third person. So in the first person, that's I or me. In the second person, it's you, regardless of singular or plural. In the third person, this is where the masculine and feminine potentially comes in. She, her, he, 
they and them. And you'll notice the they and them apply in the plural form, don't have masculinity associated with them either. So it's only third person singular where there's any gender association with it whatsoever. Aside from personal pronouns, there could be demonstrative pronouns. And that refers to things near or far. This, these, that, and those. No gender identifying difference there. Indefinite pronouns. Anybody, anyone, anything, each, either. The plural forms. Both, few, many, several. Singular or plural. All, any, most, none, or some. There is no gender identification in those pronouns at all. Reflexive pronouns. Myself, ourselves. Yourself, yourselves. Himself, herself, themselves. You can see the same rule applies. It is only in third person singular that there is any gender identifying component. Now, interrogative pronouns, what, who, which, whom, whose, they're used to ask questions. No gender identifier there. Possessive pronouns, my, your, his, her, and there we go, singular, third person, possessive, mine, yours, his, or hers, ours, yours, theirs. The plural forms of those have no gender identifier at all. Finally, subject and object pronouns. I, you, she, he, it, we, you, they. The singular third person applies. Aside from the use of singular third person, no other pronouns indicate gender. Now, if I'm going to have a conversation with someone, I will only use first and second person pronouns. I would say, where are you going? I wouldn't say, where is she going? If I'm talking directly to the person. Naturally, I would use I or me to refer to myself, never he or she. What results is the fact that a person would only use third person masculine or feminine pronouns to refer to other people. The Ontario Human Rights Commission has codified the requirement to address people using the pronoun of their choice. But gender identifying pronouns are never used to address someone. They are used to address someone else. If this is the case, how can it be said to be harmful to an individual's sense of self? Now, going back a little time, in 2010 there were discussions around the invention of pronouns that were gender neutral, along with discussions about which one could be the best and which may become widely accepted and widely used. So they included, at the time, ni, v, a, z, as in z laughed, z, or zai, along with hier or zir, and then zhi, the xe that you'll find at the bottom of this list. So discussions about this have been continuing for some time. Now, in January of 2017, Sussex University introduced a policy to stop making assumptions about gender and to use the pronoun they until it is known if a person has a gender preference of he or she. They encourage this, but indicate that enforcement is impractical. And back in 2015, the University of Tennessee introduced the pronouns she and z to replace he and she to promote inclusivity. The intent here was to remove anyone's gender. There would be no he or she. G or z would be used as gender neutral in all cases, so there would be no conflicts. Now, I can't find information as to whether or not this has caught on and has been widely accepted at the University of Tennessee since 2015. But most importantly, it should be noted that there is a distinction between what Sussex was doing. Tennessee was saying, remove gender altogether, and Sussex was saying, let's delay gender use until it becomes known. Until then, let's just use the word they. Now today, the list has not become smaller. It has gotten longer. Since 2010, there are many more pronouns available for use, and that list continues to grow. There is no consensus as to what gender neutral pronoun should be used. This hasn't limited confusion, but perhaps has created more. So this list of third person singular gender neutral pronouns include, we'll just go through some nominative, A, E, E or A, C, S slash H, E, along with here, the H-I-R version, Z, G, V, V, Z or Z, E, as in E laughed, then to be used with I kissed M, or I kissed Het, Thon, Hu, Hesh, Ni, Here, with an apostrophe, and then to be used with Him, Er, also with an apostrophe or without, N, 
high, lay or la, himmer, er, c, c with a silent h, co, te, which also refers to tem, te laughed, I kissed tem, schli or schle, z, per, na, n, rim, a, as in the two letters a, e, along with i, a, y, et, he, she, to be used with hen, han, Herm and Phi with a PH. The references can be found below and I'll provide a link in the description. And the list itself is getting larger as opposed to smaller. And that's an indication that within the transgender community and the community at large, it hasn't been agreed to yet on which way to go when it comes to the use of this type of language. Jordan Peterson had first begun discussing his issue on the implementation of law. There wasn't a school policy, a suggestion, or a social test being conducted to try to implement the usage of a new word. The Ontario Human Rights Commission believes it is a discriminatory violation to not refer to a person by a pronoun of their choice. The list is growing and is not well defined. Since we are only referring to third person pronouns, a person can state, why does it matter? What's the difference if it is almost never going to come up? And the appropriate response may be that until the gender neutral or gender altering pronoun list is agreed upon within the transgender community, the best place to start should not be by imposing discrimination law on others. Implementing policies such as Sussex or Tennessee are perhaps a better way to try to use newly invented words, to see the benefits and find if they can become widely accepted and used. Laws have penalties, and compelling someone to use an ever-growing subjective list of ill-defined words is something the government should simply not get involved in. I believe this to be the core of what Jordan Peterson's argument is. This gets taken out of context so often as he tries to engage others when questioned about gender identity being fractioned, about gender expression, and whether it's a question of respect. These conversations are inevitable as he defends against the onslaught of complaints that he is transphobic and a bigot. I hear him willing to engage with his opinions on these issues, and he openly admits that argument here can benefit everyone. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened if, two years ago, say, a student had asked Mr. Peterson to refer to them as Z. This may have happened, but I think the conversation would have been much, much different without a law behind it compelling a person to use words that may not have been invented yet. His objection to Bill C-16 linked the discrimination law to federal hate speech legislation in Canada. The concern to me is clearly one of opposing government legislating what people must say. I see no reason that protecting transgender people from discrimination must include compulsion of speech. I believe transgender people are discriminated against. I believe that protections must exist for them. This protection is misguided, however, and I disagree with it. Remember, like and subscribe, but most importantly, leave comments and engage with others. Open discussion is always needed. If you have nothing valid to say, Zero Fox Given.